I'm Keith Kaiser, and also listening are my parents-in-law, Fred and Sue Scott, who are visiting with us from Wisconsin for some weeks. And my mother lives with us all the time, Patricia, so she's here as well. And then we have one of our dear local sisters from our home assembly, Sister Valerie's with us. And my wife, Naomi, of course, and our four children, Anastasia, Nadia, Fiona, and Micah. And they all send their greetings. I want to turn with you in God's word to Psalm 102. Psalm 102, please. This is a messianic psalm. Some things we read in the Old Testament remind us of the Lord in certain ways, some ways by comparison, some ways by contrast. But this psalm specifically is quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 1 regarding our Lord Jesus Christ. So we know it's a messianic psalm and a psalm that Charles Simeon, who was a well-known preacher in England, in Cambridge, England, back at the early part of the 1800s, he said that there's no psalm that is more mournful or full of lamentation. And yet we'll see that the psalm's going to end with joy. You notice the title of it, Psalm 102. I'm reading from the New King James translation. And before I read, by the way, uh, since this is my first time ever speaking to you, just so you know who I am, I was brought up in southeastern Pennsylvania, where I still live. I still fellowship in the assembly where I was raised. We meet at Grace Gospel Chapel. We're in a city, um, little town called Gilbertsville is where we meet. And I live in another little town called Birdsboro. Don't worry, most Pennsylvanians don't know where those places are either. So if you've never heard of them, you're in good company. Uh, but we are not far from Reading, Pennsylvania. That's about 15 minutes away of Reading Railroad on Monopoly, if you have the old Monopoly game. Or we're about an hour northwest of Philadelphia and about 45 minutes east of Lancaster. So maybe that puts us in some kind of geographical setting. I was privileged to be raised in a Christian home, which of course did not ensure that I was saved, but what it did ensure was that I heard the gospel as early as I could remember. And I had praying parents, and on my dad's side, praying grandparents, who prayed for me every day of my life from the womb uh, till the Lord took some of them home. My father is in glory since 2011. But my mom, as I said, is still living with us, and she celebrated a birthday yesterday. So we're glad she's in good health by God's mercy. My wife, Naomi, comes from Iowa originally and has a similar testimony like me. I got saved when I was a boy of seven. She got saved a little bit younger than that. But her parents were believers and uh, very diligent in presenting her with the gospel. She's one of five children. And all are grown and married, and thanks be to God, all are born again and going on for the Lord. And I had to go to Canada to meet my wife, actually. So we met in Ontario, not in Alberta. I've only been to Alberta once. Uh, back in 1998, I went up to Salem Acres for a conference. And so I was uh, near Red Deer, Alberta. And we were looking forward to coming to you this June, but obviously the Lord has providentially ordered it otherwise. So we'll hope. That will get up to you another time uh, in the future, Lord willing. Okay, you should be at Psalm 102 by now. Psalm 102, and the title is, A Prayer of the Afflicted, When He is Overwhelmed and Pours Out His Complaint Before the Lord. So that sets the tone right off the bat, that this is one who is afflicted. This is one who feels overwhelmed. This is one who's pouring out his complaint. And elsewhere in the Old Testament, that word for poured out has to do with pouring out one's life. So you can think about the depth of someone's heart, the depth of their life they're pouring out here. We read in verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me. In the day that I call, Answer me speedily, for my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned like a heart. My heart is stricken and withered like grass, so that I forget to eat my bread. Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. 
I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and am like a sparrow alone on the housetop. My enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me, for I've eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Because of your indignation and your wrath, you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow that lengthens, and I wither away like grass. Now that's the first section of the psalm, and we'll look at it in three sections this morning, but uh, by and by, we'll see that there's a change when verse 12 says, but you, and the tone decidedly changes at that point when he speaks about God. Just a little homespun outline. The first 11 verses are going to talk about the suffering servant identifying with his people. The suffering servant identifying with his people. Those are verses 1 through 11. Then verse 12 through verse 22, we're going to think about the sovereign Lord illuminating his people, the sovereign Lord illuminating his people. And finally, from verses 23 through 28, 23 to the end, we'll think about the Savior's immutable life on behalf of his people, the Savior's immutable life on behalf of his people. I'll send those outlines. I have another one as well, a little bit um, more thematic. I'll send those to Brother Roy by email later, and he can pass them on to you. So don't worry about uh, writing down uh, too furiously there. In any case, the first 11 verses that we've just read certainly strike a doleful note. You can tell this person is suffering greatly. And it's a natural thing for a believer that when we suffer, instinctively we cry out to God. And he starts here saying, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Now Israel had a great confession that God taught them in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And to this day, Jews right around the world recite it. And in Hebrew, the first word of it is Shema. So they call it the Shema. And that confession in Deuteronomy 6 was, Hear, O O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And it was a confession of who the true and living God was, that Jehovah or Yahweh, as some would transliterate it, that that God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who redeemed his people out of Egypt, that that God was their God. There are no other gods but the Lord. He's the one who made the heavens and the earth. The other gods of the nations are but idols. That's what the psalmist says elsewhere. And here he uses that same verb to open the psalm. But instead of a confession, hear, O Israel, this is a plea with that God. He's saying, hear my prayer, O Lord. He's crying out to the Lord. Now, it's wonderful when we think of the New Testament promises that the Lord Jesus told us, uh, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. Or the Lord would later tell his disciples in John 14 that if they asked anything in his name, he would give it unto them. Or we have again in 1 John 5, the promise that if we ask anything in his name, we know that we have the petitions that we have desired of him. So those are just three citations of many, many more where we could show that God promises to hear and to answer his people's prayers. Now, of course, when we are suffering, we may have a certain way that we want God to answer answer those prayers, or we may have a certain timetable in mind. And here the psalm, the psalmist is, is like that. Uh, when he cries out to the Lord, he says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Look at this. He says, Answer me speedily. Now, that occurs 10 times in the Old Testament, that phrase, answer me speedily. And nine of the 10 times are in the book of Psalms. The other occurrence is in Job chapter 13. But over and over, Psalm 13, for example, he'll call on God to answer him speedily. And we can sympathize with that, can't we? And maybe we can empathize with that. There are times when the sufferings we go through is so intense, we cry out and we say, Lord, I need you. 
and I need you right now. I, I'm not praying for six months from now or six years from now. I want you now, Lord, six minutes might seem like an eternity to us when we're suffering under a heavy trial. And the thing is that the sufferer, as we'll find out as we go along in this psalm, is not just an ordinary human sufferer. It's not just people like us who go through various trials in this world. Our Lord said, uh, you shall have tribulation. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world in John 16. But here, really, we get to understand that the sufferer who is talking is really Messiah, the one we know as God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that will become apparent as we go to the third section of the psalm by and by. But imagine that, the feelings of the Lord Jesus in his perfect manhood, crying out to his father, and there's sometimes when you suffer that theologically you know God can see you, you know God can hear you, you know the truth of what the scripture says, but existentially, we might say, in your own experience, it seems like God is far away. Did you ever pray and pray and pray for something? And you wonder, is God hearing me? Is this getting through? Well, the word of God assures us, yes, it's getting through. And that's where faith comes in. We've got to hang on to the promises of God. And no less so than when we're suffering. But before we move on to the Lord hearing that prayer, before we get on to the Father hearing his son as he prayed, uh, consider more how he describes the depth of his situation, his pain. Verse 3, he says, For my days are consumed like smoke. This is kind of like the Old Testament equivalent of what the book of James says in James chapter 4 when he tells us, But what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and that fades not away. I've never been a smoker, uh, thankfully. I've never had problems uh, with that habit, but I have had a number of campfires in my life. Uh, even this week, we've had a few in the backyard with our children. Got to roast the marshmallows in these troubled times. And so uh, we've been out there, and it's amazing how you can watch this smoke and how quickly it dissipates. That as soon as you extinguish that fire... That smoke goes away in just a matter of seconds. You pour some water on it, there's a lot of smoke that comes up, and then it's gone. And he's saying, that's what I feel like. That's how my days go. They're just being burned up, and I seem to have nothing tangible to hold on to. What's more, that burning was internal. Verse 3, he says, my bones are burned like a hearth. <coughs> so it was like having what uh, Ezekiel described as a fire in his bones. And so there was this consuming fire. And when one has a fever, the bones can ache, they can hurt, can't they? And Psalm 31 is also going to use a similar image to talk about his bones that are suffering. We can, of course, think of Psalm 22 more famously, where the Lord said, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, and all my bones are out of joint. Now, when you talk about bone pain, that is a severe and intense kind of pain. Uh, people who have had different kinds of blood cancers like leukemia or people that need to go in for a bone marrow biopsy or even you might think about breaking a bone. Think about how painful people who go through those things describe that as. And he says that's the kind of internal suffering and this afflicted his heart verse 4 my heart is stricken it's like the idea of heat stroke is this word it's like actually receiving a blow and withered like grass now how often the old testament in psalm 104 and isaiah 40 uh, and even the new testament quoting it in first peter 1 talks about the glory of man like a flower and like grass and it talks about it being withered and when you think about how in the Middle East they have that dry Shiraka wind that comes out of North Africa and blows across Israel. And you can have beautiful lush green grass that grows up in the morning under the dew. And by afternoon it's dry and brown and desiccated. And I've been to specific places in Israel 
where you could stand on the edge of the Judean wilderness, the Judean desert, and you can look in one direction and all is brown and dry, and you look in another direction and all is green and verdant. And there's, you know, sort of the line of where the water comes and where the water doesn't come. And maybe it's like that in some places in Alberta. I don't know the geography there enough to speak of that. Maybe it's like that in some other places where you might come from. But it certainly is that way in Israel. And he said, my heart is stricken and withered like grass. How much are you suffering? Verse 4 says, so that I forget to eat my bread. Now you can go back to very ancient sources and read about other people talking about being so (coughs) sorrowful that they can't eat. In fact, there's a famous passage in Homer's Iliad where uh, Aphrodite comes down, or uh, is it Athena? One of those Greek goddesses comes down and she's imploring Achilles to eat something. And Achilles is so deeply in mourning that he doesn't even eat. He's just so sorrowful he can't eat anything. And you can think sometimes how when you're sick, your appetite goes away. Uh, You know, when a person is regaining their appetite, that's often a good sign of health. Or even when we lose a loved one, we often have refreshments, often we'll have a meal after a funeral. But the family, if you watch them, a lot of those people don't eat very much because they don't feel like it. They're so sorrowful. They're mourning. And he says here, I'm so sorrowful in, in a sense that I forget to eat my bread because the sound of because of the sound of my groaning verse five, my bones cling to my skin. So you can imagine if you've seen footage of people that are starving and malnourished or people that have been through horrible events like one thinks about the Holocaust and all that terrible footage that was taken in 1945 when the Allied powers went in and started liberating Birkenau and Auschwitz and Dachau and other camps like that. And the people with the sunken cheeks and the hollowed eyes with the glazed staring look. And one can think about uh, Bangladesh in 1971, I think it was, and the famine they had there and the pictures that went around the world or Ethiopia around 1984 or unfortunately many, many places in the world since, right up to the present day, of people suffering famine and starvation and hardship. And here he has that look, that look of just being withered up, that wi- that look of starving. I'm like a pelican of the wilderness. I'm like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and I'm like a sparrow alone on the housetop. Now, these birds really aren't known for sure what they were, but It's obvious by looking at where else they appear in their few occurrences in the Hebrew Bible. They were all animals that were solitary animals. They're all a lonely picture, if you were, if you will. They're out in the desert. They're they're birds of ruins. In fact, the Arabic phrase for that that bird called the pelican there is called a daughter of ruins. Because you often see that bird in ruined places. And Zephaniah too speaks of this type of bird there and he says that's how I feel I feel entirely deserted you can think about other psalms that talk about the Lord being utterly bereft of companionship that his friends are far from him that he is a stranger to his mother's children and you can think about how the Lord cried from the cross that lonely cry of dereliction my God my God Why hast thou forsaken me? As he suffered under the judgment of God for sins, the loneliness there. And as well as not being able to eat, he couldn't sleep. Verse 7 says, I lie awake, or some render it, I keep watch. It's the idea that I can't sleep, so I'm watching. My eyes are looking out for deliverance, and I'm lonely. And on top of this, there are enemies. Verse 8, my enemies reproach me all day long. Those who deride me swear an oath against me. And uh, really the sense of the Hebrew reading some of the scholars on this is that they actually take the psalmist, they take this suffering individual, and they make him a curse. In other words, they say of him, uh, when they want to curse somebody else, may you be like this person. May what happened 
to Jesus on the cross. May that happen to you as well, would be the kind of thought we're thinking here. They're speaking against him, reviling him, reproaching him. He says, those who deride me swear an oath against me, for I've eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping. Again, these things in scripture are associated with mourning because of your indignation and your wrath, and you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow that lengthens or declines, and I wither away like grass. So even though he mentions here the enemies, and we can think about how Psalm 22 speaks about the strong bulls of Bashan that encircle him. He can, we can think about the dogs that that psalm says gaped upon him with their mouths. The Lord is feeling so forlorn and bereft and lonely, but the worst of it is, that he starts talking to his father again, starts talking to God, really. I want to be careful of my terminology because in the seven statements of our Lord on the cross, the marker between when he says father and when he says God is very pronounced. And so when we're talking about the Lord praying for others, it's father. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But when we think about the Lord suffering as the Lamb of God for sin, it is not the Father in his primary, he is the Father, of course, but he's called God when he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God is acting there, not in fatherly capacity, but he's acting as the righteous judge of the universe. Now you might say, Keith, it's semantics, they're one in the same being. The Father is the righteous judge of the universe. Well, amen to that, but scripture uses its terminology very specifically, I believe, to assure us that the Son always has been pleasing to the Father, and never more so than on the cross. And when he went through those three dark hours, in a sense, the Father was like Abraham with Isaac. They went both of them together, and the Father was well pleased with what he was doing. But as the righteous judge, he couldn't show favor to the Lord Jesus. He couldn't show him light. He couldn't show him all the goodness and the compassion that he knows. He couldn't say, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. Those things were taken from our Lord as all peace and joy was taken from him as he suffered for our sins. And when we think about our, what our Lord went through, how his suffering spirit pass through those three dark hours, we look at these uh, 11 verses and we say, as graphic as they are, as horrible as they describe affliction and pain and physical pain and psychological pain and emotional pain and spiritual pain, as bad as all that is, it's not like that feeling of suffering under the wrath of God. He speaks about it in verse 10, because of your indignation and your wrath, you have lifted me up and cast me away. So there's this thought of being cast away here. There's this thought that was brought out in type on the Day of Atonement when there was one of the goats that was slain and his blood carried in and offered before the Lord, before the mercy seat and on the mercy seat. And there was that other goat that was the scapegoat, the one that was sent out never to return, that one that was sent out to bear away that sin. And the psalmist speaks in another psalm of him removing our sins as far as the east is from the west. As horrible as this suffering under the wrath of God was, as awful as it was for our Lord to be made sin for us, the wonderful blessing that flows to us from it is incomparable. Now, as I said, the tone changes decidedly in verse 12 as the sovereign Lord illumines his people here. And in verse 12, he says, But you, O Lord shall endure forever. And that's a contrast to the suffering nature of this fallen world, isn't it? And the transience of humanity in this world, that we as human beings, we're here for a little time, that our life passes away like smoke. Uh, Moses would talk about it in Psalm 90, wouldn't he? Teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom because you've given us three score years and 10. And if they be more by reason of strength, yet it's futility. It's that feeling of passing away. But the Lord, by contrast, when we speak about the living God, you, O Lord, shall endure forever and the remembrance of your name to all generations. You will arise and 
and have mercy on Zion. For the time to favor her, and the word favor is the word to be gracious toward her, giving her what she doesn't deserve, that time has come. You will favor her. You will arise and have mercy on Zion. For the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. For your servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. So people could come back and they could look at Jerusalem and we don't know exactly when this psalm was written. The great scholar A.F. Kirkpatrick thought that Jeremiah wrote it and many people believe that it was written after the destruction of Jerusalem and maybe this verse is a hint of that, that he talks about Jerusalem's stones and her dust and you get the picture of a ruin. And you can think about how I was reading it just this morning in my devotions in Nehemiah. Nehemiah opens and one of his brothers, Hanani, comes from Jerusalem and tells him about the ruin of the city of Jerusalem. What kind of a decrepit and awful state it's in. And Nehemiah weeps and he mourns and he fasts. And it's palpable. It's evident on his countenance. The king can see it on his face when he goes to work as the cupbearer. And so uh, the people of God, the saints, they love Jerusalem, even in its ruins. And what he's looking toward here is the time when the Lord's going to arise and show mercy to Jerusalem. Now, mercy is God's compassion in action. God reaching down in our suffering. The Lord Jesus described mercy in that parable of the Good Samaritan. It's being a true neighbor to someone who's suffering. And our Lord arises to minister to Zion, the poetic name for Jerusalem. And this is a picture of what he's going to do one day for Israel. You could think, dear friends, brothers and sisters, about how much Israel has suffered through the centuries. And even in Bible times, how many times they were invaded, how many times that city was assaulted. You read about it under the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, before them the Syrians. And you read about it under the Romans, of course. And the sufferings have gone on and on and on. And still it's a battleground, isn't it? Still it's a place under threat. And the future time of Jacob's trouble, what the New Testament calls the tribulation, the great one, that is going to be a time when Jerusalem and Israel will suffer like they've never suffered before. And the things that will come upon the earth will be so great, that tribulation so intense, that if God doesn't cut it short, no flesh would be saved. So says our Lord Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. But the wonderful thing is pictured in Zechariah 12 through 14, that the one whom they pierced is going to come and deliver them. That, as Romans 11 says, out of Zion a deliverer shall come, and all Israel shall be saved. The Lord's going to come back to earth on the Mount of Olives and rule and reign over Israel. He will rule on the throne of his father David, his great ancestor. This is not the rapture, of course. The rapture is for the church. That's the Lord coming to receive us to himself in the air. We're talking about him coming after the tribulation to the earth and the great restoration that will happen to Israel. And as one writer has said, it's not just Israel that's restored. Look at the Gentiles in verse 15. So the nations shall fear the name of the Lord and the kings of the earth, your glory. For the Lord shall build up Zion. He shall appear in his glory. He shall regard the prayer of the destitute. He shall not despise their prayer. This will be written for the generation to come, that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. So in the first 11 verses, it sounds like Messiah is suffering so much that there's just an end of him. And is it all worthwhile? Does anything come of this? And we remember what Isaiah 53 says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. Yes, there is something that comes of this, because after the suffering comes the glory. Our Lord said in Luke 24, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? And what he's saying is, through that suffering, everything God promised for Israel, that future glorious restoration, this wonderful kingdom that even the church is taught to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven that the Lord Jesus is going to accomplish that. The one who suffered will come and rule and reign and accomplish all of his father's purposes. And that future generation, not yet born, 
is going to see this. Why? Because verse 19, For he looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven the Lord viewed the earth. Now can you imagine that expanse? Don't just think in terms of light years. I mean, heaven I, I would consider probably other dimensionally. In other words, we can't send a space shuttle or a rocket, however pow powerful, there. Even if we invent warp speed like science fiction, we'll never be able to build a ship to take us to heaven, will we? And you get there by knowing the Lord Jesus. That's the only way to go to that highest heaven where God dwells. And you think of that immense expanse of how high God is. And sometimes people say about dignitaries here on earth, oh, that person's so high up he wouldn't take any notice of me. The prime minister or the president or the king, whatever leader of a country, they say he's too busy with high and mighty matters. He wouldn't worry about me and my problems. But the God of heaven who's high above us, he looked down, verse 19 says. He sees what we go through, and he hears as well, verse 20, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to release those appointed to death, literally the sons of death. Now, when you're a son of something in Hebrew thought, that's what characterizes you. That's your <laughs> destiny. So Judas was the son of perdition. So is the man of sin. It means these people are so sold out to Satan, so given over to the evil one's will, that they are characterized by lostness. Even prior to their damnation, even prior to being cast into hell and the lake of fire, as they eventually shall be, these men live out the putrid, evil, wicked nature that they have. Well, if you're a son of death, that's about the most desperate kind of statement that the Hebrew Bible can make about you. You're as good as dead. You're appointed to death, as they translate it here. To de but he's going to release those, notice, verse 21, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. And when the peoples are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. So that wonderful second section shows us the result of his suffering. That Messiah who suffered all these things, by his suffering, now enables the God of heaven to come down and visit the earth with this glorious blessing that will be manifested in our Lord's future reign on earth during the millennium, and even manifested beyond that in the eternal state. But when we come back to the third and final section in verse 23, we now come to back to talking to Messiah. And this section really uh, is going to bring out for us uh, what the Lord here has accomplished. And so he says, verse 23, he weakened my strength in the way, he shortened my days. We think about how Isaiah 53 speaks about him being cut off out of the land of the living and who shall declare his generation. And so this one was cut down in the prime of his life. He didn't live a long life. He sa I said, O oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. Your years are throughout all... Um, now this comes... Now, let's let me stop a moment. Right there in the middle of verse 24, when it starts to say, Your years are throughout all generations, I believe we have a change of speaker here. And you don't have to take my word for it. Read Hebrews 1 very closely. We don't have time to do it this morning. But read it closely, and you'll see this is the Father speaking to the Son. So the beginning of verse 24, verse 24a, you might say, the Son is saying, Oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my years. And you think about Hebrews 5, 7, that talks about the Lord making strong cries and praying to his father that he might be saved out of death not saved from dying but saved out of death a prayer i believe that was answered in the resurrection that he wasn't going to be left in death that is another messianic psalm says and peter quotes this one in acts 2 psalm 16 says thou will not leave my soul in hell or in sheol the place of the dead but uh, thou thou will not let me see corruption so here he says, do not take me away in the midst of my days. And the father answers him, your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. 
Now, saying your years are throughout all generations, he's saying to the Son of God, you're eternal. And when we think about the eternal Son of God, John 1 tells us, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1 tells us that all things were made through him and for him, and by him all things consist. That is, they cohere or are held together. And Hebrews 1 tells us that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. So creation is attributed to the agency of God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the Father's the creator as well, and we can see the Spirit there involved in creation uh, back in Genesis 1-2, and he's also referred to in Psalm 104 and other places in connection with creation. So it's one of those great works of the triune Godhead. But here the Father says, You're eternal, your years are throughout all generations. Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, the heavens are the works of your hands. Now, what about about that creation verse 26 they will perish but now here's the contrast but you will endure yes they will all grow old like a garment like a cloak you will change them and they will be changed it's like folding up the old laundry and taking it away that's how God looks on this creation but the thing about Messiah the Lord Jesus is that he is unchanging. The creation is changing. The creation perishes, but he endures and is unchanging. And verse 27 says, but you are the same and your years will have no end. The theologians call this God's immutability, that God doesn't change. And we think about what Hebrews 13 tells us, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't that wonderful? that the creation itself is going to pass away, but the creator not so. He's going to remain immutable. This one who is God is going to be on the scene to see all of the future blessings that come in the millennium. And he's the one who's going to preside over the renovation of the earth and the rule over the earth. And then he's going to preside over the new heavens and the new earth being brought in with the new Jerusalem as capital. What a wonderful thing. You would read the first section of the psalm and you would say, could anyone ever endure that kind of suffering and come back from it? Could anyone ever be the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and yet bring about all the glorious triumphant things that this psalm speaks about? The ancient rabbis didn't think one person could do it. They had a debate. They finally decided there must be two messiahs. They spoke about Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah son of Joseph. And they said, like Joseph, he suffered. But then they said, the other Messiah, he's going to be Mashiach ben David, Messiah son of David. David, of course, reigned. And so they said, there must be two Messiahs to come, one to suffer and one to reign. But we know from the Bible itself that that's totally wrong, isn't it? that one person unites it. The same one who suffered is the same one who's going to reign and that nothing is going to hinder him from taking that place. I think we sang it this morning in Thomas Kelly's great hymn, Jesus takes the highest station. Oh, what joy the sight affords. What a wonderful thing it is, brothers and sisters, that our Lord already is high and lifted up that our Lord already is at the right hand of the majesty on high, according to Hebrews, that our Lord, according to 1 Peter 3.22, has entered into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and principalities and powers being made subject to him. And that also would include, by the way, viruses and governments and economics and every other thing in this world which is passing away. But our Lord remains. He will endure. And finally, he closes with this beautiful thought, verse 28, the children of your servants will continue and their descendants will be established before you. So think of the wonderful security if you're one of God's people. In this age, as our brother was telling us this morning, we're held in the Father's hand and we're held in the Lord Jesus' hand and we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of redemption. So we have utter and total security in our Lord Jesus Christ. But in that millennial day even, God says he's bringing about that remnant and he will save those children. He will bring them 
through awful tribulation, yet not so bad and awful as what he himself passed through for our sake and for their sake. And our Lord who suffered and rose again in power unto glory will raise us up unto glory and will raise Israel one day to glory as well. So thanks be his name. We indeed have a lot to be thankful for. Let me pray for you, and then I'll turn it back over to Brother Roy. Father, we are thankful for thy word uh, that shows us all that the Lord suffered, all that he went through. And uh, we can't help but think that this is not some banal description uh, of a literary fiction. This is not something that men made up. This is actual history. This is what our Lord went through for us. And we, uh, we just are astounded when we think that he'd be willing to suffer that. And we say with the hymn writer, wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, he was wounded for me. We're also glad we can say, gone my transgression, and now I am free, all because Jesus was wounded for me. We thank thee for the Son of God, who's not on a cross today, nor in a tomb. Indeed, he died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried. But he's also risen again. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And we thank thee that he's ascended up on high and led captivity captive and given gifts to men. We glorify and praise him and we praise thee, Father, through thy spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Keith, for speaking to us, joining us and speaking to us. Thank you very much.